Well, uh, this is Preeti, and I'm doing my MBA at Sloan School of Management. Uh, in the next set of sessions, we will be deliberating the various aspects of how to evaluate startups. First up is the billion dollar question on how do you evaluate seed state startups? We have with us here Kevin Colrin, who's the managing director of Slow Ventures. He's an early stage investor in Pinterest and Pillpack and many more such impressive companies. He's also one of the first 10 employees at Facebook and is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal. Joining him, we have TJ Parker, who is the CEO and co-founder of Pillpack, the startup that's helping people across the companies get their medications on time. Uh, he's also named one of the 30 under 30 under Forbes, as well as in the Inks magazine 30 under 30 in 2016. All of you join me in welcoming both TJ and Kevin. Hi, everybody. Let's make it awkward. <laughs> Always keep your founders this far yeah. away. <laughs> Investors and founders. No. I could lie down. You could lie down. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk to you about my dog. He died. Um, anyway, who here does drugs? <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's got a coupon code. Um, so I am Kevin Colloran. As, as mentioned, I worked uh, at, um, at Facebook from 2005 and through 2011. I was one of the first 10 employees, um, started the, uh, out of my apartment in New York, and uh, ended up uh, staying with the company until it was about 5,000 people. When I left, I moved here, uh, thanks to my wife being from here and my family uh, as well. And with a, a couple of friends, started investing, uh, seed investing or angel investing in, uh, in tech companies. Um, a group of, of friends, all from Facebook, we pooled about $15 million of capital and wrote 175 checks between 2011 and 2015 into a whole lot of things, this being one of them. Sorry, you being, you're you. not at this anymore. Um, and, uh, and then uh, recently, beginning 2015, uh, decided to institutionalize the fund, and uh, we raised about uh, $250 million so far. Um, to invest larger amounts, um, but focused mostly on, on uh, seed stage companies. And who are you? I'm TJ from PillPack. Um, so PillPack is a pharmacy that makes it really easy for people that take ongoing chronic medications. Um, so we sort and deliver their sort and package their medications based on when they take them throughout the course of the day. Uh, we then deliver them to their door, and we manage all the coordination with their insurance company, with their doctors, do all the heavy lifting. So that's super easy for folks that that take medications. Um, we started the company in early 2013, and we launched the product in early 14. Um, to date, we've raised about 115 million in capital, um, including from Kevin. Um, and we are now servicing customers all across the country. Um, we are located in Boston, or our offices in Somerville, so right down the street. Um, and then we have pharmacies across the US, and then another office in Salt Lake. Um, company's about 600 people uh, at this point. Um, before that, I was in school and did a lot of work actually helping run uh, things like this. So helped run the 100K at MIT, helped start hacking medicine at MIT, so I was really involved in this community. Um, and before that, I was in college. Keep going all the way back. All the way back, yeah. the whole story. Um, how many people here have raised capital from institutional investors? How many people here see that as being something they may do in the future? Cool. Um, so I was at a, a dinner with a bunch of MIT people the other night, and all, many of them were either had just or were about to start raising um, seed funding. And basically, the, the, the questions were consistent of, of you know, brilliant people doing brilliant things and not having much insight as to how the fundraising process goes, what the, you know, what you should do, should not do, et cetera. And so we figured we would take um, you know, maybe 15 minutes or so to, to talk ourselves and then open it up to you guys. Happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, TJ obviously wants to talk about kind of, or is happy to talk about his experience of raising capital. As I said, over $100 million um, t takes, uh, takes some work. And um, you know, we've, as I mentioned, we've invested now in over 250 companies, and so I'm happy to talk about things that have and have not worked. But um, 
Why don't you start, so going back to that point um, when you were doing things here to the yep. point of actually having a company that has 600 employees and $100 million plus raised, there were probably a few steps along the way. Um, so going from the, you have this idea, maybe even talk about, I mean, your background in terms of being a pharmacist and seeing, seeing the opportunity and then actually committing to an idea and deciding, you know what, I'm just going to go be a CEO and start this thing instead of the typical career path that you had planned on. Yeah, um, so as Kevin alluded to, I am trained as a pharmacist. I didn't actually go to MIT. I went to Mass College of Pharmacy across the river. Um, and during school, my dad had started this new kind of pharmacy that actually sorted and packaged meds very similar to PillPack, um, but delivered to nursing homes, assisted living facilities, sort of long-term care facilities. And I'd always had, knew I wanted to start something or be work at a startup or do something entrepreneurial. I uh, spent th like probably three or four years running around here trying to s understand how this whole thing worked. Like, how do you raise money? How do you meet a co-founder? How do you start a company? How, do, how does all this stuff work? Um, was in a lot of the sort of 100K judging sessions where you'd have oftentimes venture capitalists and angel investors uh, watching uh, someone pitch their idea, oftentimes a student pitch their idea. And I sort of observed that whole process. And by the time I was on the other side of the table, had a little bit of insight into how investors think about evaluating an idea. Um, and then we first pitched the idea of PillPack uh, at a hackathon, uh, that uh, MIT Hacking Medicine hackathon. Um, and we got a good response from that. We, we won the hackathon, but we started the hackathon, so it was a little bit of a misnomer. Um, is there a conflict there? No conflict. No. It was a th I think it was a $1,000 prize, which was a big deal at the time. Um, and then ultimately that sort of started the snowball and we would get together once a week as a team to work on what the company could, what the company would be, what we, if we'd actually build a pharmacy, if we build a platform, how much money we'd need to raise. Um, and within three or four months it applied to Techstars, got into Techstars, um, which was early 2013. Um, and from there the whole thing kind of snowballed. So it was a lot of sort of build up of understanding how investors think about writing checks uh, to just pitching it for the first time at a hackathon to four months later, I think we had 120K from Techstars. Um, and then within about five months of that, raised the first, I think, four mil 500K and then three and a half million, so about $4 million. Uh, but really, the, the biggest thing was, uh, was really just pitching it the first time and getting feedback, and then people around here that really helped. How did you decide how much, I mean, that's a large round for that soon, right? So, you know, the way, the trajectory we usually see is there, it used to be the seed round was the first round, that's now kind of turned into the second round. So there's this angel round that happens first, which from my experience, probably the average is 500 to $750,000 being raised. Usually it's friends, family, and some strategic people, you know, it's 50K and 100K checks. Um, that usually gets you somewhere around a year worth of operating. Uh, then there's the seed round, which you know, now you, you have a year of, of under your belt. You've got some metrics to show. You may have a prototype. You may be already in market. Um, I think the average usually we see is probably a million and a half dollars raised uh, for a seed round, which then gets you another, should be 18 months. Um, so now you're two and a half years in when it's a Series A, which we typically see as being $5 million fundraise or so. So it seems like you did that pretty accelerated. Yeah, I mean, I think compared to a lot of uh, startups, we are asset heavy. Um, so we had to build an actual distribution center. We had to buy automation to do the packaging. Um, we had to sort of get licensed nationwide. So there's a lot of baked in costs at the beginning. Um, we followed that trajectory somewhat. It was just really accelerated. Um, so we. Uh, we raised a, the 500K about two months into Techstars. And then tactically what happened was that in Techstars you have this sort of build up to demo day or any of these accelerators is this build up to demo day. And it's all sort of on some level operating off of FOMO. Um, and by the time demo day happened, everyone felt like they missed the first sort of pre-seed round. And then that parlayed into what I think we were going out for three million and we ended up closing three and a half. Um, and the primary reason for raising that much, is, again, was that it was, there's just a lot more infrastructure that we had to build to even go to market. We couldn't sort of test the idea with just a piece of software or um, half a dozen engineers. Did you find your investors as a result of the Techstars experience? 
uh, some of them. We found our first two angel investors as a result of the 100K and Hacking Medicine. They're actually two of the judges that I used to sort of recruit to help judge. So the first, the first people which so often more conflicts of interest, more conflicts yep. of interest all over the place. Uh, the, I think the first couple investors are always the hardest, and it was nice for people that I sort of knew. I didn't know them super well. Um, and then the first institutional investor, my co-founder had worked at Founder Collective, so he knew them well. Um, so conflicts of interest all Great, over the place. Yeah. So, Work at the 100K, work at Founder Collective, and then you're good. Yeah, it's a, you know, just start a business plan competition, <laughs> win that business plan competition, stack the deck with judges who will then invest in Find your business. Find a co-founder that works at a venture. Get a co-founder that works yep. at a VC firm, yep. and it's easy. Off to the races. Really, like, you know, all these people talking about it being so difficult. Yep. Um, the found, so we, we struggle with, with this because we, we've seen the trends. It used to be that there were very few you know, accelerators, incubators. Yep. Um, then there all of a sudden were hundreds of companies a year, you know, Y Combinator and Techstars in multiple cities and, and so many more. And I think there's been, there's been points of view on both sides as to whether it makes sense to go into one of those accelerated um, um, learning environments, you know, rapidly, 90 days typically, go from idea to some sort of prototype, try to raise as much money as possible afterwards. What do you think about, I mean, obviously your experience was a little while ago, but do you think that you being a first time founder at that time, being coming out of a pharmacy school, not being an entrepreneurial or business trained person was, do you think that experience helped? It definitely helped for, for me and for the company. Um, I think every every instance is different. So for some companies, it's been a good experience. Some it hasn't been. I think being really clear about why you're doing accelerator. So for us, we did the accelerator primarily to accelerate the process of raising capital, and that's what we hope to get out of it. And we got that out of it. Um, and I think in the process, met a, a lot of folks in the community that we didn't know before. Um, so for us, it was worth it. Um, I think for us, the decision point at the time was: do we do one of these healthcare-specific accelerators? Do we do a Rock Health or a, a Health Box, something like that, or do we do a tech-specific? And we found the capital raises typically go better at the, at the Techstars type accelerators. Um, but that was four years ago. I, I don't know if the market has changed. Um, at the time, it was a pretty no-brainer decision. At this point, Y Combinator feels like a no-brainer decision. And then I think all the other ones are very dependent on the company um, and whether it makes sense for them. So one of the questions I was getting the other night at that dinner was, um, which was surprising to me, is, is we, my fund has a policy against doing uncapped notes, right? So um, typically a seed round, you know, instead of having to go through the, the hassle, paperwork, and legality of, of creating a, a true equity round, there someone will use the Y Combinator safe agreement, if you're familiar with that, or, you know, a, a kind of a simple um, a debt instrument. and. You know, the only thing that really needs to be determined is, is what is the cap of the valuation, which is not really a true valuation now. It just means when we raise again in the future, um, as you know, we will be adjusted to that valuation with usually some sort of discount um, for having come in early. And it was interesting that the, the students, I'd, or not students, but the alumni that I talked to from here had said that uh, the lawyers that they had worked with and the ecosystem that they'd worked with around here told them never put a cap on the note. Um, and uh, and basically, what that means for me as an investor is is it's a little bit you know it, it's been too hard for me to overcome that because if you're going to come in early, you know usually a year before other investors are and take much more risk when the when the idea is still just an idea and there's really no infrastructure or business, the idea of just getting kind of a 20% discount to the next person that may come in a year or more later when there's so many more proof points, so much you know so much of the idea has been, been de-risked. It doesn't make sense to me unless there's some sort of, of, of cap on the upside. And basically, the, the, I, my concern, the reason why, why we've pushed forward is the misaligned incentives, I feel, between an investor and a founder, if there's an uncapped note, is significant because the founder wants the um, valuation to, to run as high as possible before that first you know, investor that believed in them first gets their equity. And of course, the investor wants the lowest possible valuation, which means that, you know, should I be as helpful as I can? Should I make as many introductions as I could, et cetera? Because, you know, reverse incentives. So you guys, yeah, maybe, how, maybe how did you... To put on the valuation in the future. So how did you guys <laughs> handle figuring out how to, you know, being first time, was it the text? I mean, I assume tech stars taught you certain, certain things about that, but figuring out what your valuation should be and how to set up valuation along the way so that it didn't become a, a, a problem either between your relationship with your investors or a problem with your ability to raise money in the future if you didn't achieve certain goals because a, a down round is a, you know, perceived to always be a bad thing. 
Yeah, I think we got very lucky, not just with Techstars, but getting a really good, experienced, early stage investor involved. That's not Kevin. Um, just kidding. Yeah, we the, you're great as well. There's good investors and there's not. <laughs> uh, we had, so the first institution of money in was David Frankel at Founder Collective. Um, and we, we navigated all these, do you do an uncapped note? Do you do a party round? Do you do strong, like a strong lead in your next round? And leaned very heavily on David for advice through that period, as well as the folks at Techstars. Katie was, was super helpful um, working through all of that. Um, but I think getting an early stage investor that both knows other folks in the community that will be a good fit for your next round, helping sort of educate and, and walk you through what makes sense and doesn't make sense. Um, we, I think we wrestled with this, it was four years ago, we, we wrestled with doing an uncapped note or, or sort of pricing the round or doing a cap note. And, and Dave and, and other folks pushed pretty hard on the fact that you want alignment with all of your investors. And especially, we're I mean, seeing this even later stage now, you're seeing uncapped notes and weird debt instruments um, that seem great at the time, but then have all sorts of potential for downside. Um, and that was really just leaning on people that were super helpful, whether that was early investors or, or folks at Techstars. Were, um, at what point did you decide a board of directors was necessary? And it sounds like you know, Dave Frankel probably operated in that capacity, whether he was officially yep. one or not, but how, how did you go through that decision? Yes, yeah, so we didn't do a board on the first half a million, which I think is pretty normal. Um, the capital in, the timing of the business, the, that oversight didn't feel ne necessary, and we had one institutional investor, which was David, um, and I think he acted in that capacity, but it didn't need to be formalized. Um, we raised the priced round that was three and a half million. Um, it made sense to put a board together. I think you're off, it, not always, but oftentimes at that amount of money, you're going to get pushed by the investors, and it's a pretty standard thing to do. Um, and it made sense for us. Um, we, I think, made a five person board at the time. That was myself and my co founder. And then the two, that we basically split that three and a half million dollar round between Atlas and Founder Collective, um, and they each got a board seat in that process. Um, oftentimes, I think it's more normal to have two plus one lead. Um, for us, I think five was a nice size. I think five is a good size in perpetuity. Um, and it was nice to have more than one personality on the board so they get some balance and some different opinions. Um, but I think, it, it, I think you experience a breadth of this in a way that I don't. Um, but for us, at that capital amount, it, it was pretty logical. What, what have you seen from, is it dollars in? Is it timing? Yeah, I mean, I, we. I would say the majority of company, first of all, at, at that angel round, the, you know, the 500, 750, there's no reason to have a board. Um, fast forward a year, now you're uh, a year in, you're going out for the seed round, you know, as I said, usually a million and a half dollars or so. I have seen it go either way. Um, we typically don't ask for a board seat when we, when we write one of those checks, and if we do do it, it's usually with the incentive of getting off the board as soon as possible, you know, kind of a, you know, taking the seat in order to be a mentor advisor, to make connections, to be helpful, but in reality, we want to just be there until the, uh, the, bigger, the bigger funds are around the table, the people who, you know, our, our models, we write a lot more you know, checks than a typical VC. Um, you know, we will do probably you know, 30 or 40 investments a year um, among five of us, and a typical venture capitalist will write one or two checks a year, which allows them to be on boards. A typical VC is on 12 boards usually at any given time. You know, that's kind of the max when you can do it. But um, for us, we were much more interested in, in, in making more, more bets um, without having to make the long-term kind of uh, decade-long commitment of, of the board seat. And we don't think our strength is being part of your Series B or C and, you know, in, in preparing for an IPO, et cetera. We think it's really to, uh, to get you the initial capital you need to get the business started and to make the introductions to who will likely become your first board member being your Series A you know, lead investor. Um, conflict between founder and board, or founder and investor. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with who you choose as investors and vice versa. Um, I think ideally you have the same people that are willing to write checks you actually like, which is always helpful. Um, I, I think a lot of board and investor management is really just keeping folks in the loop in a very sort of real-time manner. Um, there's lots of mechanisms to do that, but I think no one likes significant surprises. Um, and for me, that's been less about sort of formal monthly or bi-monthly investor updates and more sort of ongoing sort of short snippets in text or hop on the phone or just keep people in the loop about what's going on. Uh, it's not like everything has been rosy and everything's been great news, but I think 
in, in the process as things are developing, keeping people in the loop and, and not obfuscating stuff and being as transparent as possible um, has limited conflicts. But I think if you choose the wrong investor, you're sort of starting off in a really bad place. Um, so it's really about people that you can get along with and be real with. I think different people have different personalities um, and then really sort of ongoing communication about what's going on in the business. And I, I think that you know, there's, there's two sides in terms of founders who just really want the dollars and want the dollars at the highest valuation versus founders who actually want the mentorship advice you know, of, of a, a true partner. Um, how, you know, what are the ways in which, and then, and then there's the pitch that, that me as a VC and, and that I see, the, the pitch that, that the VCs make to founders, especially founders in competitive rounds, as to why their firm is better than the others. You know, we, you know, everyone, Andreessen Horowitz is, is you know, now famous because of the mass, mass infrastructure that they have um, to do, the, you know, they'll handle your, handle your legal and your CFO responsibilities, they'll, they'll do your recruiting for you, et cetera, versus other funds that completely focus on we are just a small group of partners and we are here for advice and mentorship, but we don't have, you know, infrastructure tools. You know, what do you think makes sense, and how have you seen, how have you seen other than a source of funding and a source of quarterly meetings, yep. investor, investors playing an active role? I think one of the benefits of being a first-time entrepreneur with, experience, with an experience at a lead investor is that you truly want the advice, you want the perspective, um, it, it, and I think choosing the right investor that can help with that is really paramount. Um, and, but I, I think most of the time that for me has really just been about personality, um, and obviously there's lots of things that go into who you pitch and whether they've done similar companies before and things like that, um, but it was really came down to personality. There was, Two instances of funds that delivered really specific things. Um, Kevin was one of those, was super helpful um, at one point in time, getting us sort of approved on Facebook and helping us work through that process. But it is a general rule that was more choosing a generalist and a personality that I thought I could actually learn from and, and truly wanted to learn from. And if that wasn't the case, it probably just wasn't the right fit. Um, but I didn't. I wasn't looking at things like in, interest in infrastructure or first rounds like Founder Portal. Like those were all things that were pitched. Um, I think it really became who do I want to actually spend time with and deal with, you know, deal with when things are good and when they're bad. Cool. Uh, so ten minutes left. Any questions? We can. Real life scenario. Yes. Did you raise money from university endowments? You're asking me, I assume. Uh, I, I did not. No. Um, yeah. So, so, so slow. We are well, in, uh, sort of indirectly. I did, yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you did. Not well, directly. Well, and most VC dollars you get come from university endowments. Um, so we we tried our. our kind of philosophy for slow is, is much different than a typical fund. Um, because it was started as the personal capital of about 10 friends that all worked at Facebook, when we expanded to become larger, we ended up raising money from about 100 other individuals um, who were all CEOs of tech companies. Uh, CEO, well, founders, CEOs, key executives at tech companies, and our request to them was we wanted everyone to play an active role uh, in the investment process. And the reason for that is we think that you, know, you, can, you can take money from universities, but you know, the university is not going to play much of an active role in, in you know, helping you find investments, diligence investments, et cetera. And we felt that at the seed stage, the most important thing is, is getting you know, expertise and network. And we thought, OK, if we have the CEOs of companies from social media companies to payment processing companies to virtual reality companies, et cetera, when we see stuff that seems really interesting, we then ask those LPs to, to meet the company on our behalf. Um, and so we can kind of be generalists. Um, and our, our kind of rule is I don't necessarily, as the investor, have to be a master of understanding the business that's being pitched to me. As long as someone in our ecosystem, which is usually one of those 100 um, LPs, is an expert in that ecosystem. And they can say, listen, usually, you know, and we see this all the time, is most founders are so busy being founders that they likely don't really have time to be angel investors also. But just through the day-to-day through the -day of running their business, amazing people come into their office and they say, wow, like if I actually had the time or bandwidth or interest in doing the paperwork, I would totally invest in this company because you're building something incredible, but I'm so busy you know, running my business. And so our request is basically 100 of people that see those types of founders um, you know, come into their office. And we say, when you get that inkling that like, man, this person that just came in for that meeting is incredible. If I actually had a little bit more time, I would have written a check myself into this company. We ask them to forward it to us and, and you know, call that out in the subject of the email. 
Um, and so basically, you know, we do now have, only now in the most recent fund, we brought in a couple university endowments. Um, but other than that, it is, it is this group of kind of these 100 individuals. And then what we also did is we brought in VC firms, um, which is not uh, very typical. We've got a couple dozen VC firms that have invested uh, either their own partner capital or fund capital into Slow because we see stuff much earlier than they typically want to invest. And so we'll do the seed round, and then we'll make the introductions to those people to lead the Series A or Series B. And what we find is, is when you can tell a founder at the very beginning, the reason why you should take money from us is not just because it's money, but because you're getting now the access to these 100, you know, so he mentioned, you know, we helped him with Facebook. We have a lot of ties to Facebook. They had a problem there. We were able to rectify that problem, which most other firms may not have had the, the direct path to helping with that. And we try to, and we have that with basically 100 different companies. And what we say to most founders, you don't know who you're going to need help from. At some point when you're building your business, there is going to be, you're going to need help getting onto Facebook or getting on to, you know, getting, you know, becoming a beta test of some sort of product, a, a big company that's being tested or, um, you know, whatever it may be, you know, finance help, et cetera. We say we have all those introductions. And so, you know, think of us much more as a network rather than a pool of capital. Um, and so that's kind of how we, you know, we do. So, yet, so yes, in order to grow now in further, you know, the other individuals do have a, a natural kind of um, threshold as to how much they can invest into a VC fund you know, continuously. And so as we want to grow the fund, we do start taking outside capital from VCs, but we, or sorry, from uh, endowments, but we do keep that network of those 100 individuals and those VC firms, and those are the ones who play an active role. Yeah. Oh, just What's your uh, median uh, size of investment? And uh, you said that you don't uh, do uncapped, so how, what's your maximum cap? in the notes, how do you do that? I mean, yeah, I just so, wanted to learn on the process. Well, yeah, what we see in the seed round, again, you know, so, so typically we are the second you know, time a founder is raising, and they have been doing their business for a year, and they've been doing that on this angel money that they've raised from friends and family or you know, kind of angel investors. Um, so they are further along than, you know, than, and this is very different than what it used to be. So it used to be the seed round was you know, two kids and an idea, and there was nothing more than that idea. Um, now, I think because the opportunity to, to make progress without much capital, whether it's through because of Amazon web hosting or, or just you know, other things, we really want to sit back and see how scrappy were you and how far did you get on either the money in your own pocketbook or, or, or the money from, from friends and family. And so for us, um, typically that is a $1.5 million, $2 million seed round. It's typically at some sub $10 million valuation. So it's you know, a 1.5 on a $7 million cap note or an $8 million round. Um, and we will write a check of any size from the full amount down to usually $500,000. The difference that we have for most funds is most VC funds want to get 20% ownership of a deal. Um, for, you know, because that, as I mentioned, because that founder is only doing, or sorry, because that VC is only doing one or two deals a year, um, he or she needs to have enough equity to make sense that, that they're going to spend so much time on it. With us, we're doing five, six, seven, eight deals um, a year, and, and we are fine being the second largest check, which is very different than most. So, so a, lot of times, a lot of times it's a zero sum. You know, someone is going to win the lead position to, to, to write you know, the lead check of a company, and the other people will have lost. You know, the other VC firms will leave, and, and then you'll fill, it, you know, fill whatever's left with strategics. We say, listen, you can either choose us to lead or choose someone else to lead, and we'll just take whatever's left because we'd much rather be part of this company going forward instead of saying we couldn't convince that you know, that founder back on day one, and so we now have no, no ownership. Yep. Um, and so it's different, you know, and time will tell. Like, as a result, we end up doing probably three, three times more investments per fund, and we probably have one-third the amount of average ownership per company, but we think the quality of all of the companies is higher because we don't have to actually win zero sum. We can kind of be in all of the things that we, th that we see that we think are great. Yeah, so you'll, you'll find, so our, our policy, and, and this is basically, you know, we ask, as many investors do, for pro rata rights. Um, so if, if we're buying 7% of your company at the beginning, we want to be able to maintain that going forward. Um, with a small seed fund, you, you, there's usually a limit to that. You know, if you get into a company that becomes a rocket ship, just maintaining your ownership is going to be, you know, 
a ten million dollar check when our whole fund is is not much bigger than that. So, um, and so we uh, we ask for the ability to do it, and then it allows us to at some point say, okay, you know, the the valuation is too high. We are happy with our ownership. We're going to get diluted down a little bit, but we still own enough that we're, that we're happy. So, typically. Um, you know, if we if we start at the seed, we'll do one more round. So we will do our pro rata at the A, and then by the time it gets to a Series B or C, we usually are, are just you know kind of on the sidelines, cheering for the company, but not actually writing new checks. In the back, yep. So I guess having worked with a lot of founders, have you ever had like because we hear about you know a lot of the experience that you guys have been talking about has been fairly positive. Have you ever invested in someone, and for TJ, have you ever taken capital from someone where after the fact you realize? oh crap, like I don't actually want to work with this person and sort of how does the situation play out because you already have capital invested in them? Yeah, he tried to send ours back about three times, I think it was, <laughs> until we had to hire a lawyer and it got pretty nasty. Uh, no. Um, I don't even think you would participate in any of our rounds after the first one. Well, that, wow. that, that, that was our old, old yeah. model. So. Um, we, we are fortunate that the amount of capital we are putting into a company as a percentage of the entire fund is pretty small. It means usually less than 1%, almost always less than 1%. And so if things don't go well, we can kind of part ways and be okay with it. You know, it, it's, we're never going to, you know, sue or try to fight legal, you know, it's like you kind of, you, you try to diligence a founder as best you can and you try to make sure that it is a match and you trust that they are going to do the right thing and if you find out that they didn't or that for some reason it's not working, you know, we will politely say, hey, you know, we're, we're happy to just forego our pro rata rights and we wish you best of luck to continue raising, you know, capital from other investors but clearly this relationship, you know, we're, we're not being helpful to you or you're not, you know, receptive to that help um, and so for us, like, you know, it's, Absolutely, I and mean, we have 250 investments, there are certainly founders that we said, wow, that, that, that person didn't do what we thought they were going to do or didn't behave in the way that we hoped they would have behaved or there's been some signs that make us think that we probably shouldn't put more money in this business. But you know, you, at, again, when, you're only, when you've only invested $500,000 or a million dollars, it's a lot easier than if you are a later stage investor and you just wrote a 50 or $100 million check and then find out that. How about you? Uh, I have not. I mean, I think a lot of it is diligencing your investors and spending enough time with them and being super transparent about the business. Um, so luckily, so far, have not had any sort of bad uh, relationships or things that went south. But well, it my also, breath is not the same yeah, as Kevin. I know we're out of time, but it also helps when you have a company that many investors are trying to get into. Um, I think, I think you know, when, you, when you have choice, you can do that process. I think it becomes much more difficult when one, you know, one investor is willing to actually take a shot on you and you don't seem to be you know, feeling a great vibe, but it's like, well, I'm either going to have a business that's funded or not. And th those are the tough scenarios. And uh, you know, if, if you can have choice among investors at each stage of your company, yeah, I think your, your likelihood of success goes up dramatically because it gives you the opportunity to do some diligence or make an A versus B choice and not have to kind of, you know, as I say, it, it, you're getting married, right? Like, especially if it's a person that's going to be on your board for 10 years, um, you know, potentially, like th that is, it's really hard to be in that position with someone that you, you know, don't necessarily get along with. It's so, also, I think, why not just choosing to do a deal because it's an uncapped note or the valuation is meaningfully higher than the others becomes more and more important. Um, I think you have to work with these folks for hopefully a long time. Yeah, do not try to, this is always, always the investor to say this, do not try to optimize for the deal terms or the valuation. Um, if, some, if some relationship feels a lot better and they're offering you something a little bit less, you know, less attractive monetarily, but it's a person that's going to be able to help your business or that you think you can scale with, like, it's crazy to me when you find out. And that's actually a, a big, a big red indicator, like red flag for a founder. It's like, you know you're the right person, they've already told you you're the right person, and because someone else, you know, that may not, for whatever reason, came in with, with over the top um, um, offer, and they choose that if they, you know, even though saying that's probably not the right you know, VC for me, but the offer was so good. And it's like, that's when you say, you know, phew, like I'm glad, I'm glad we didn't end up getting married because, you know, your incentives may not have been aligned. Cool, thank you very much, everybody, appreciate it.